um, in verse 10 that said, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offering after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And, and so he said, This is my covenant that you shall keep. This is between me and you and your offspring after you that Abraham had a part to play in this. He had circumcision not taken place. The covenant would have been ratified. It would have never been enacted. But the interesting part as I read this, think of what Abram thinks. Now, he's, it, it just told us when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord showed up and spoke this to him. Okay? And he's been told that he has a land that is his through the, the other covenant with the cut in half animals. Now this covenant it talks about I'm going to be your God. We're going to be an everlasting covenant. And then he comes to him and tells him what I need you to do is circumcise yourself. And I thought, see I'm Abraham. I'm 99 years old and you want me to do what? Like can't we just do like a dress code where we all wear the same shirts or something, God? I mean, you know, maybe we could like get a tattoo? Earring, maybe? Wear a hat? I mean, is there some other way we can do this than circumcision? And, and you know, it just made me stop and think, like, for those of you older folks that may remember the, uh, the Bill Cosby skit where God came to Noah, he said, I want you to build an ark, and Noah's like, yeah, right. <laughs> Who remembers that? Yeah, right. And so God comes to Abraham, Abraham and says, well, I want you, for this covenant, I want you to be circumcised. He's like, yeah, right. I, I don't know, I just, it's just one of those times in reading the scripture, like, this is, all right, God, you, so, okay. And the other thing I thought about, now, here Abram's been told, or Abraham's been told that he's going to have a son. Okay, now, as most of us know, there's ways that children are produced. And this, this thing that God's now talking about is part of that process, like, what's going on, God? You know what I mean? I'm supposed to be having a son here, and... And, uh, but he says, and every male among you. And uh, so then, it's interesting, in verse 11, we find that there's no question the place of where it's to happen. He says, you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and that shall be a sign of a covenant between me and you. Okay? Um, and so we, we notice through different covenants, the covenant that God made with Noah, we had the rainbow as a sign, okay? This is a sign of a covenant that God made with his people, with Abraham and his, his offspring, will have to be circumcised. Um, and so I thought about it, I said, well, wait a minute now, a rainbow is a quite easy thing to see. I said, hey, there's a covenant God Circumcision is a little more hidden, I'm thinking. Unless they're at a nudist colony, there's, you know. But, but it's interesting as we look at it, we'll see the reason behind it. See, God's playing the long game. Let's just put it that way. He knows what's to come. Um, So Abraham then goes on, and in verse 12 he said, um, the covenant between me and you, and verse 12 says, who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or brought with money from any a foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is brought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people, and he has broken my covenant. Um, and so 
one of the things we have to understand is in all the covenants that we see with God, there's always a shedding of blood. There's always a letting of blood, okay? And so one of the things that we would know that when Abram was circumcised, it was bloody. When any of the males were circumcised, it was bloody. There was blood shed, and this was part of what God was, was ratifying this covenant with, the shedding of this blood. And the other thing that's interesting is, is this is a particular part of the male body that actually can be removed, and it affects nothing of the body. It's not like if you took off an ear or a finger or a leg or a toe. This is actually a part of the human body, the male body, that can be removed and not affect his, the rest of his life, which is interesting to me that God had, had um, put that together. And it made me think about our son Austin because we had him circumcised, and he was young. And so I took him with the nurse into this little room, and they have this process where it's just a kind of a shearing situation of those of you who have never seen it. It's pretty interesting. Um, and Vern and I had prayed that it would not be a traumatic thing in this young little boy's life. And so we went in, and the nurse did this thing, and next thing you know, it was off. He never cried. He didn't wince. There was literally no blood. And so we walked out into this nursery area, the nurse carrying Austin, and the other nurse looked like, you're done? I didn't hear anything. Usually it's traumatic. And, and it, I just say all of that just to show that God is able to supersede by our prayers and, and make what normal to be supernatural. And even the nurse said, I, this is, I've never, never, and so God did something supernatural that day because we asked him to. Um, and so one of the things, it, you know, it talked about here is how every one of the males, whether they're born into the family or brought into the family, had to be circumcised. And the interesting part, it says that any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised, in verse 14, in the flesh of their foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And so you've got to imagine that on, on those that had come in, they had the opportunity to reject this covenant. They said, no, nope, I'm not going through that. But then verse 14 says, well, if you don't go through it, you will not be involved in the covenant. You will not have the covenant blessings and the covenant provisions if you're not circumcised. And, and I tie that over into our world. It's the same thing with an unbeliever. If you offer them the opportunity to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, they have the right to reject it. But they need to be made aware that if you reject it, then you're rejecting the covenant. You're rejecting uh, an eternal heaven and keeping the eternal hell. It's your choice. You get to choose whether you enter into this new covenant or not. It's up to you. And it's the same thing here. It says that he's broken my covenant and they'll be cut off from it. And, and the amazing part about the good news is that unbelievers are already cut off from it. What we're offering them is the ability to be a part of it. We're offering them the opportunity to be a part of it. And so I thought, what a crazy thing to camp out on, Lord, and have to stand and teach on is circumcision. There's something better that a guy can talk about on a Sunday morning. You know what I mean? It just, I thought, this is really? Um, but here's the reason that we're doing that is because we find that it's, it was a huge, from, from this point on, circumcision is a huge part of God and his covenant and God's people, and, and we're going to get into the new covenant and see 
um, a lot. There's a lot in the New Covenant about circumcision. And so one of the things, if you remember when Paul says, hey, uh, you know, you guys boast, but if you want to use boasting, what was the one of the things Paul boasted about? He said, I'm born of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. See, that was a big thing for the Jew. That was a boast, that they're the circumcised and you're the uncircumcised. We're believers, you're unbelievers. You know, it was a huge differentiation between this relationship between God. And so circumcision was a big thing. Um, so here it tells us in verse 14, if you're circumcised, you're in. If you're not, you're out. It's just literally that black and white. Circumcised in, not circumcised, you're out of this covenant. Um, and remember, this was the sign of the person that had a covenant with God. Circumcision. And I talked about last week, David and Goliath. What did David walk out into that valley and he looked at that nine-foot giant as a little boy and what did he proclaim that gave him the strength and the knowledge that he could overcome this giant was the fact that this was an uncircumcised Philistine. He had no covenant with God. We do. We're circumcised. Okay? And that's what caused him to put the rock in that sling and fire it. Because he knew that he had this covenant promises that God had made to him and he was bold enough to stand up and declare it. You realize that all of his brothers and all of the rest of the army that were there were all circumcised also. But they weren't realizing the fullness of what that meant. Who they were and, and the promises God gave to them. And, and what's interesting is that circumcision we find in Leviticus 12, 2, that God spoke to Moses about being circumcised on the eighth day, that the males among them, and so now we find that circumcision actually was part of the law, that the men were supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day, okay? Um, and so here's where we transition over, because the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant, we find the types and the shadows, and we find Jesus Christ concealed. So when we transition into the new covenant, we find the types and the shadows revealed in Jesus Christ. Everything pointed to Jesus Christ in the old, and it's revealed in the new. And remember now, we have a better covenant with better promises. Amen? If we think that this covenant was good that God made with Abram, what we have is far superior, amen? Um, because it was part of the law of Moses, it became a stumbling block for the New Testament believers. And we're going to see that here in a minute. Um, in Luke 2.21, Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus was, because he was a Jew, and because he kept all of the law, he was taken on the eighth day and circumcised. If he hadn't been, then he would have not fulfilled the law completely, which he did. For you and I, he kept all of the law. Um, so what we find out when we transition now into the new covenant, we, we, we get into the, the body of Christ or the church in the early days, circumcision was a big thing. So there was this distinction of the circumcised and the uncircumcised brought up a lot in the early church. Because remember now, it's God's now fused the two together. The Jew and the Gentile now are brought as one and made one in Christ Jesus. And so if you think back about that interaction that God had with Peter up on the rooftop, where he dropped the sheet down numerous times with what would have been unclean animals. And Peter said, no, I don't, I don't partake in the end. So after the third time, finally, God got through to him that what I have called clean, don't you call unclean. So if you remember the story, then all of a sudden there's a knock at the door. Peter goes down, and it's somebody from the house of Cornelius. 
And so Peter then goes to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, shares the good news of the gospel. They get saved, and the Holy Spirit falls on the people, which means that God received the Gentiles. And what was the big thing spoken of is that the Holy Spirit has come upon the uncircumcised. That God is, is working in the uncircumcised. It was a huge thing at that time because there was this huge chasm between the circumcised God's people and the uncircumcised as the people that were not God's people. And now we see that God is working in the uncircumcised. And so they went out and, and they told them uh, about this sign that God gave the Holy Spirit to the uncircumcised um, and it's interesting that that was a big to-do because you had this huge distinction in the early church. They still were wrestling over the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And as we get going here, we'll see, um, and that, that was in Acts 10, 44 through chapter 11, if anybody wants to look that up. So then we find in Acts 15, let me get to my... Um, and I'm going to read it because Paul dealt with this a lot in the early church. And, and the reason it's important to us is because, of course, circumcision was part of the law, keeping of the law. And, and so in the early church, they had to get the people to realize that the law had been made obsolete. It was no longer of value and, and that it's not by the law, but it's by faith. And so there's a lot of it dealt with here. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 12. And listen to what all it says here. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, but see, remember, it's easy for us to do that, but see, they're in a, they're in a, a new time frame they're trying to sort out this new thing that God was doing, bringing the Gentiles, bringing this other flock of sheep into God's flock of sheep. So I don't get real, real, uh, um, I don't point fingers at these people. They were trying to figure this stuff out. But it's interesting to see this was their mindset. Unless you are circumcised according to custom laws, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small decision and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So here's the question. Do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? Remember what we read in, in Genesis that if you're born into Abram's family or you're brought into Abram's family, you have to be circumcised all the male. So here's where it arises. They say, okay, we're bringing these people in to this Abrahamic covenant. Don't they have to be circumcised like God told Abraham back in chapter 17? And so they're dealing with that. That's the question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversations of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. Remember, this is, this is dealing with the Holy Spirit coming upon the Gentiles. Um, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them in order uh, in order." Uh, them to keep the law of Moses. So see what they were wanting them to keep? Now remember, we're in the New Covenant, but they're wanting them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after they had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he does us. And he made no distinction between us and them, 
having cleansed their hearts by the faith, or by faith, now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ just as they will. What a declaration. Peter stood up and said, hey, listen, we're all saved by grace. We want, to, we want to have this grace message for us, the circumcised, but boy, we want the law to be in operation on the uncircumcised. He said, listen, this is the weight that neither us or, or our fathers have been able to bear, trying to live up to this law situation. It's unkeepable. But we came to the realization that when they heard the message and they applied faith to it, that they received the Holy Spirit, which means that God approved of them, God cleansed their hearts, God indwelt them, and that they're saved by grace just like we are. So they're trying to, to bring about the truth of the matter that circumcision is no longer a necessity for or to be called a, a one of God's people. See, it used to be and it said in Genesis, if you're not circumcised, you're not in the covenant. I mean, it clearly said that. Circumcised in, not circumcised out. And so they have that same mindset, and they're trying to work through those differences. So God said that if you're not circumcised, you're out. And notice it's the Pharisees that are wanting this. They want people to follow the law. They had not seen yet the, the grace of God enacted in this new covenant. And so they said, listen, I didn't believe it either. I went to Cornelius' house. I shared the good news with them because God told me, don't call what I've cleaned unclean. Because see, Cornelius would have been unclean. He wasn't circumcised. And, and, and so then he shares the good news with them. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, which validated the fact that God had chosen them. God had brought them into the sheepfold. And so now we have to work this out amongst us and see um, that, that what God is doing now, it's a new covenant, it's a new thing. And here we're going to go on and see um, how Paul had to deal with this issue, this issue a lot. This came up a lot in Paul's ministry. Um, and so I'm going to read Romans uh, four. What did I do with Romans? Um, let me get to it here. Because there's so much in this. Um, and there's, there's a lot here. But if you listen to it, I'm telling you, it, it will change a lot of the way you think if you think that law-based, works-based is how God relates to us. So this is now Paul writing to the Romans. It says, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham? Remember, that's where we just left, God dealing with Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. David looking forward in time to us. This is David proclaiming what he sees in us. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness, 
How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? There's the question. It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that had been by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised. There it is. To make him the father of all who believed uh, without being circumcised, so that the righteousness would be counted to him them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and to his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of his offspring not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, in hope believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So your offspring shall be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith and gave glory to God. Here it is, fully convinced that God was able to do that which he had promised. Amen. And so Paul's explaining to them, listen, it's not about the works of the law. You earn a wage for that. It's about faith and the gift of righteousness. And so we go on, and here's where um, it really gets amazing, because now we see, we're going to see the type and the shadow come into being here in Christ. Um, and so we find that the promise came by faith, and not by your works. And Paul hammered this home. I'm telling you, you read Philippians, you read Galatians. You, almost every book Paul wrote, every letter he wrote, somewhere in there he dealt with this circumcised, uncircumcised situation, trying to show them that, hey, it's not by works, circumcision. It's by faith. Amen? And so today you stop and think, okay, well, uh, what if I'm not circumcised? Am, am I out? Here's the amazing part. Here's where all of it ties together in Christ. Colossians 2, uh, 6 through 15. And this, this is amazing. If you'll listen, it'll, it, I'm telling you it will change things. Therefore, as you have received Jesus Christ as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of this world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Here it is. In him also you were circumcised when were you circumcised when you got born again with a circumcision made without hands by putting off of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us, the law, with its legal demands, and he set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authority and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So you have to picture this. Here you and I were, before we were saved, uncircumcised. Whether you were, I was circumcised as a child, but this is the spiritual circumcision. So when you and I, the scripture tells us, when you and I came to Christ, when we died in that baptism, he separated our flesh from us. That's what it says here. By putting off the body of flesh. And I'm telling you, if you get a hold of this, it, it will make things easier when, when you try and walk out this Christian walk. So now you picture uh, circumcision of the foreskin. So now this piece of skin is cut off and it's separated from the body, right? And so if you were to picture that piece of skin getting cancer, would it affect the body that it came from? No. It's separated from it, right? When you and I received Christ and we were buried with him, this scripture in Colossians said that in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off the body of flesh through the circumcision of Christ. So now you have to realize that our flesh is separate from us. This is huge. So that's why when you and I fall in the flesh, it cannot affect us in our spiritual being. We've been separated from that body of flesh. Do we have to drag it around with us on this earth? Yes, we do. But when we get the revelation that we have been separated, that's why scripture says, no, no man after the flesh. Because the flesh is, has been corrupted by sin, but thank be to God, in our death, burial, and resurrection with Christ, he separated our flesh from us, raised us up as a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, sealed us until the day of redemption. Amen. And you and I are free from the dictates of the flesh. That's why scripture says, not walk not after the, the lusts of the flesh, but keep in step with the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. But the key thing is, is that if we don't understand that separation that God did in Christ. Remember, circumcision had bloodletting, okay? The covenant. How did our covenant come to being but the blood of Jesus Christ? He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. My blood shed for the new covenant, which made the old one obsolete. That's why circumcision of the flesh is no longer an issue in the body of Christ. Whether you're here today circumcised, it doesn't matter because you've been circumcised by Christ in your new creation. And I love the fact that my flesh has been separated from me because that's where I have my issues. My spirit man's a happy camper. It's moved and sealed and, and set apart for the work of the Father. And, and the problem is, is if you don't grasp the truth of this, when you fall in your flesh, you make it part of who you are, and then that's when you get downcast on yourself. Now, do we want to give in to the dictates of the flesh? No. In fact, the closer we walk with the Spirit, the less we will. The more we grow in grace, the less we will. That's why in Titus it says, the grace of God has been made known to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. It's the grace of God that teaches us. It's not the law. It's not the hammering of do's and don'ts. It's the following of the Spirit. But as we know, this picture that's been given is like a man walking around with a dead man attached to him. 
And unfortunately, until the day that we're fully redeemed, we're going to have to deal with this thing, but God has provided for it. Amen? You and I don't have to give in to the dictates of the flesh. You and I are separated from it. But I can assure you there's very few believers that understand this concept that your flesh has been separated from you. It's very obvious here in Colossians. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. It wasn't a physical deal, it's a spiritual deal by putting off of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead And you, who were dead in your trespasses and sin, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made alive. The flesh is dead. He's made us alive in Christ. In him we live and move and have our being. Amen? Hopefully you guys grasp that. That's the the old covenant of circumcision of the flesh was a type and a shadow of Christ dying for us, his blood shed, and us being circumcised spiritually. Amen? I hopefully grab a hold of that. Father, I thank you for your truth of how you so abundantly provided for us in this earth and that you removed that old man from us. He died when we died with Christ. And that you raised us up a brand new creation in Christ being alive. The Zoe of God active within us. And that I'm thankful that I can grab a hold of these truths in a, in a more vibrant and, and understanding manner so that I can walk in them and talk in them and operate in them and, and just watch you work in me and through me and in and through my brothers and sisters as we gain these truths today. And it all becomes possible through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us and gave his life for us so that we could become these new creations. So we just give you praise, Lord Jesus, for all that you did and are doing for us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. If anybody needs prayer, please come up. We'd love to pray with you, pray over your situation. Love you guys. You're the best God's got.